R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings. It was a word that he used to describe a type of story that is very unique and very gripping to most of us. It's one that is the opportunity or in the story of snatching triumph out of defeat. Disney creates a lot of stories with this you catastrophe moment in it. One of the ones that I can remember is in Beauty and the Beast at the end after that last pedal falls and it seems like he is going to die. Suddenly he is given new life and there is triumph over tragedy. Those types of stories stick with us. They ingrain our mind. If you aren't someone who has watched Disney but maybe read some classics, one that I remember was the book of Narnia. And in that, eventually the hero Aslan is killed and it looks like tragedy is setting in. But the eucatastrophe of joy coming with its resurrection and new life. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien uh, entered this into his Lord of the Rings series as the end of the series as Sam rescues Frodo and he helps him to get to the point where they are able together to throw the ring into the volcano at Mount Doom. These stories that stick with us, that change culture, that touch our hearts. It's one that he didn't come up with originally though. If it was inspired by another book, Another story that he defines as a eucatastrophe of the eucatastrophes. There is a story of all stories that impacted his life, that took tragedy and turned it into triumph in a way that was not only fictitious, but very real. It is something that has historically happened and one that we are celebrating today. It's the resurrection of our risen Savior. In our story, we have this hero who defeats a villain, who turns tragedy into triumph and becomes the ruler of all nations. Jesus Christ is our risen Savior and is able to create this new catastrophe that turns joy into triumph. It is something that we find throughout the New Testament. And even though the Bible is divided into an Old Testament and the New Testament, the New Testament, we find this story that impacted so many people, so many authors who couldn't help but share the impact that the story of a risen Savior had created and impacted their lives. The New Testament has 27 books, four of the Gospels that tell the story of Jesus there's 21 letters that explain the meaning of Jesus for our lives. It's one history about the early church and one prophecy. And all 27 of these books deal with this story that impacted them. The story that Jesus is alive. That he was risen from the dead and that he is a central living reality in the universe today. And he himself is the very God and also at the same time, man. The gospel is not just some good instructions for our lives. The gospel is not just some good ideas that are thrown together. The life of Jesus and the things that are written about him and throughout the letters in the New Testament aren't just something that is a collection of good advice. The gospel is actually an announcement of what God has done for us in and through Jesus Christ. The word gospel is very similar to the definition of the eucatastrophe. It is triumph and joy. It is real and is something that impacts us all. Today we are going to look at one of the stories of this moment in the disciples' lives where there is this eucatastrophe moment. If you would and you have your Bible or you need to look up online, whatever it is that you want to use to access the scriptures today, we are going to be in the passage of John chapter 20, verses 19 through 22. It's a shorter passage, but there is a lot to unpack in here. And so John 20, 19 through 22, we are going to begin by reading the verse of verse 19. Verse 19 reads as follows. On the evening of that first day of the first week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. 
This is one of those moments that it's hard to really wrap our mind around. It's really there is no context for this in most of our lives. This is not something that we have personally ever experienced. We've never been in a room with our friends when all of a sudden another deceased friend of ours just suddenly shows up, right? This is something that is completely out of our contextual boxes, and it's something that we is understandably recorded in the gospel message. This is something that impacted them in a way that changed the trajectory of their lives. And we see in this place where there is tragedy, there is fear, there is hopelessness, there is confinement. But as Jesus shows up, we'll see that he changes all of this. The first thing I want us to notice in this verse is there's three things that Jesus does. The first action is the fact that the doors are locked and the disciples are frightened and Jesus has come to stand among them. The first thing that Jesus does is that despite the fact that the doors are locked, Jesus still has this ability to enter into their space. Jesus could have knocked. Uh, he, I guess, is going for the dramatic approach in this instance. Uh, instead of maybe he didn't want to alert people who were around, he just enters into this room. Something that, again, is something that is so outside of our realm of understanding. Uh, is something that we create through animation and through CGI, but nothing that we can repeat in reality. And I don't know how Jesus does this, but Jesus is Jesus and he can do whatever he wants. But I think there's some symbolism in this for us as well. And in our lives, as we come to places of wherever it might be, there are moments where we are trying to lock ourselves away from the realities of the world. There might be things that we are afraid of. There might be things that have come to cause us to be panicking or anxiety or worry. The thing that I think this passage teaches us that we can draw from is that despite any walls that we might put up, despite any doors that we might lock, God or Jesus can enter in through those spaces. And he wants to enter into that space with us. There's times in our lives where we might try to go to counselors for help. We might try to go to a doctor to help. We can maybe go to friends or families to help. Maybe we go to a, a lover seeking advice or help, but there still is that worry. There is still that fear that we can't get rid of. And in our lives, as we lock ourselves in our spaces of fear, we try to keep everything else out. But there is hope. And the fact that Jesus can enter into even our most confined, restricted spaces. And he has a way of entering in that nobody else can. It might not always make sense when you're in that moment of fear or anxiety that you feel the presence of Jesus entering into your life. But we see here that in these moments, Jesus can turn our tragedy into triumph. We can allow access and reveal things in our lives that Jesus is there to heal, to help with. And even though we try to keep a lot of things locked away, Jesus wants to enter into those spaces and help us get through them. The second thing, again, is that we notice is that they are afraid. But what does Jesus do? He assures them that they don't have anything to be afraid of anymore. But of course, you know, as they are in this place, there are lots of reasons for them to truly be afraid. They just witnessed the Messiah be crucified. That wasn't in the script. That was not supposed to happen. The triumphal entry, that was supposed to happen. But the crucifixion of Jesus was not. And the isolation and the intimidation that came with that the days of silence, waiting for the Savior to speak again, and an or a tomb that was sealed did not offer much hope to them. It was understandable why they were afraid, and they didn't know what to do next. But as Jesus comes into the space, his presence assures them, his action towards them to come in there, in the midst of their fear, to be with them to show up and to be in their space to help them overcome their fear by giving them a deeper and more profound faith 
that they had a Savior who was able to overcome death, who was over, able to overcome defeat, and to be there with them. I think fear is something that we are all uh, familiar with. As a Christian and being a lifelong Christian, even though I have been in God's word, even though I have tried to faithfully follow him, there are definitely moments in my life where fear crops up. And for all of us, we have things that cause fear in our lives. There are a myriad of different things that might be causing you fear, anxiety, or worry right now. But I want to remind you and assure you that Jesus will show up in the midst of your fear if you search for him. If you seek out his truths, if you go to his word, if you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, it will give you assurance in a way that you will not be able to have assurance anywhere else in life. And even though the circumstances might not all be sunshine and roses, the assurance that you can be a faithful follower of God and that he has a plan and a purpose for your life can transform so much. So even though they are afraid, Jesus' presence assures them that there is hope. The next thing that Jesus does is that he just stands in their midst. The observation here is that he came in the middle of their meeting. He didn't come to the edge and call out through the wall. He comes to the middle of their fears to deal with them, not as a distant deity, but a present Savior. And that's something that we should take note of, too. That in our presence, Jesus comes into our spaces. Jesus wants to be in the middle of the things that we are doing. Jesus wants to be next to us. He wants to be standing with us. Sometimes we know the power of presence. Sometimes our greatest fear is just having somebody to be next to us as the world is crumbling around us is enough for us to get through those hard times. Jesus' presence creates and changes the complete atmosphere of this meeting. And we'll see that as we go on and the things that he says but again, the things that we can see that he does is Jesus enters into their lives. Jesus assures them that there is going to be a better future. And he stands in their midst to be in their presence. What does that say for the disciples and us? That Jesus is always going to be there. There's nothing that can keep him out of our lives. And that in the times where we are most afraid, the resurrected Savior can enter into our spaces and give us hope. So those are the things that Jesus does. Now we're going to see some of the things that Jesus says in the rest of this passage. Starting again in verse 19, let's read the following. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for the fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So we see the resurrected Jesus says three things. He says, peace be with you. The next thing he says, peace be with you. I am sending you. The third thing he says, to receive the Holy Spirit. These three things turn out to be gifts to all of us. Through that first one, peace be with you, we receive the gift of peace. Through the next one of the peace be with you, I am sending you, we receive a gift of empowerment. The third thing is, with receiving the Holy Spirit, we receive a gift of purpose. We have a new mission. We have a new life. We have a new destiny. So in these words, we receive a peace, power, and purpose. That's the opposite of conflict, weakness, and aimlessness that so often pervades our world, but is something that has ruined many people's lives and destiny. 
But Jesus didn't come into the world just to die and rise again, to allow us to struggle aimlessly. He came to save us. And what we see is that he saves us from our own lives by becoming himself our peace, our power, and our purpose. With that first part of peace being with you, Jesus offers the disciples a peace that is unlike any other peace in the world. It is one that was accomplished when he died for them on the cross. That peace was accomplished, and it is not imitated anywhere else in the life. It is this peace that is this joyful triumph that is earned through deep and dark tragedy. Jesus looks at him and says, I am the one who died. I am the one who you abandoned, and here I am. One of the things that God wants most for us in our lives, in a world that is challenging, in a world that is full of fear, in a world that is full of anxiety, is God wants us to have a peace that permeates our lives. It is one of the things that God wants for us. It's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to experience a peace that permeates our life. And if you could think of a peace that is just indwelling in you, that changes everything that you do, impacts every decision that you make. If you could have peace that surpasses understanding, it could change everything in the way that you go about making decisions. It could impact the amount of stress and worry that you put into things that you are out of your control. If we have a peace that permeates our lives, it can change our relationships And as we look at this, one of the things that this piece allows us to do is impact the four relationships that are really the most pervasive in our lives, the most prevalent in our lives. If we can have peace with God, think of how much that changes our life. If you go to God with the spirit of peace and you are able to be in his presence And you're able to receive that as you go and you live your life. It changes everything. The second thing that peace can, the second relationship, peace between us and ourselves. So many of our worries, so many of our doubts, so many of our insecurities come from our own defeat. This fact that we are not at peace with ourselves. Questions that we have about ourselves, our insecurities, the way that we look, the things that we're able to do or not able to do. One of the things that is hardest for us is to be at peace with our own selves. God offers us a peace that allows us to be at peace with our own selves. When we understand that our identity comes from Him, not from anything that we are, not from anything we do, but from Him, and He has a purpose, He has a plan for our lives, that changes the way that we look in the mirror and the way that we see ourselves. The th- third relationship that peace can impact is it can impact our relationship with others who are in Christ. When we are at peace with each other, it tells us that the church will grow, the church will build, the church will become what God wants us to be. If you come into a gathering of other believers and you are at peace with each other, think about how that changes the conversation, how that changes your heart, how that changes your mind. If you can be at peace with each other and grow towards what God wants you to be, those relationships are impacted in a way that changes our desire to come and worship together with others. Peace can also impact our relationship with the people in the world. We see as these disciples receive this peace from Jesus that they go out and they are at peace with where they end up. They are at peace with the things that God calls them to do and they try to offer peace to other people. People who are looking for answers in the wrong places. People who are struggling with issues in their life as they go through and help individual after individual and they offer them a peace that they were unable to get from anywhere else in their lives we see in a world a peace that can change the trajectory of someone's life it can give them purpose it can give them hope peace is the ultimate gift from god it gives us 
uh, better relationships with everybody else in our lives. And maybe you're wondering, how do I receive this peace? How do I take on something that the world doesn't offer? Maybe it's hard. Maybe it's difficult. Maybe you have to go on a long journey like Frodo, and at the end of it, you get to find peace. That is not what God tells us. In fact, it's the easy button of the Bible. If you truly want peace, all you have to do is believe and ask for it. God is ready to give you a peace that can permeate your life. All you have to do is come to him and say, I want that peace. You can pray and ask God to give you a peace in your life that is different than anything that you've ever experienced. God gave us this opportunity by sending his son to die on the cross for us. And not only did he die on the cross, but he resurrected again. He defeated death. And death is one of those things that we fear the most, isn't it? To have a God who overcomes and is over death is something that should give us so much peace. And if you talk to people who maybe have Jesus in their life and those who have not received Jesus in their life, as time is ending in their life, the conversations are vastly different, I can tell you that. People who have the peace from God, the conversations, the celebration that it is, they look forward to getting to be in the presence of God versus those who do not have that peace. They struggle, they hold on, they fight, they hurt, they endure pain, they have hopelessness that just fills their life. God offers us this peace in our lives that we don't have to go down that other road. He wants to give us this gift of Jesus Christ. Peace is a gift that can permeate all of our lives if we just simply ask God for it. And if we do that, then it allows us to do something else. It allows us to embrace our central purpose for existence. When we have the peace of God, it allows us to become who God wants us to be. And it also allows our story to become dramatically different. Instead of being a story that was going to lead to tragedy, now we have a story that will lead to triumph. Because we are with Jesus who triumphed over death, the greatest tragedy in history. Jesus wants to give us a peace. He wants to breathe into us this Holy Spirit that transforms everything about our lives. It gives us purpose, it gives us direction, it gives us connection, it gives us Jesus' presence, it gives us God's Holy Spirit, and it allows us to become who God wants us to be. We don't have to struggle, we don't have to be afraid, we don't have to enclose ourselves in fear. We can go out, we can be bold, we can be filled with hope, we can share the triumph with other people who might be in the midst of tragedy in their lives when we receive the Holy Spirit, when we're empowered by it, and we are given this purpose. Life is something that is so special. And on this Resurrection Sunday, I want and I would hope that you would make that you catastrophe decision in your life to turn your life's tragedies into life's triumphs. To pray for God's peace, power, and purpose. That he would fill your life with this peace and with this joy that is greater than any purpose that you can find anywhere else. In the peace of God, by the power of God, to do the will of God for the glory of God and for the good of others. I just want to wrap up with the story of a unique Easter insight by a recording artist by the name of Carolyn Ahrens. She was listening to a pastor and he shared these words of wisdom. He said, the world offers promises full of emptiness, but Easter offers emptiness full of promise. Let me say that again. The world offers promises full of of emptiness, but Easter offers emptiness full of promise. The empty cross, the empty tomb, the empty clothes are all full of promise. If God was able to write that story and turn that tragedy into triumph, think about what he can do with your life 
as well. If you are feeling empty from the promises of this world, I want to give you something that can fill your emptiness with God's promises. I would ask that you would take the time to pray to God, that you would invite him into your presence, that you would unlock the doors and the things that you are using to hold him out, to block him out. He already knows your heart. He already knows your mind. He already knows your soul and he knows what you need. He wants to give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. And so if you are at that place today, would you pray that God would give you that peace, that God would remove the fear and replace it with peace, that you would be able to pray for God to give you confidence in the purpose that he has for you, that you would be willing to pray for God to give you his power through his spirit, that you would pray for God to change the world this century the way that it is the way that he changed it for the disciples in the first century. Will you pray that God, for God to guide you and turn any tragedy in your life into triumph? We're going to have our worship team come back up and wrap us up in a song. If you want help with that prayer, or if you want to share a decision, or if you just need support in your life of walking through some hard things, if you'd like to come forward during this song, I'll be here to pray with you. We can connect you with some people who can help give you peace in your life during this Easter season. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the peace that you give to us. Lord, I know there are so many things that bring fear into our lives. Lord, we thank you for being in our presence, for dying on the cross for our sins, for giving us salvation. Lord, I pray that as we live our lives that we can take the Holy Spirit that you breathe into us and live fully and wholly for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please. 